Our goal is to use this week as an outreach to others. We have prayed and we have planned for nearly a year. We have an assorted group of people who have the potential, we believe, to touch a wide array of interests and a wide array of age groups. Will you please give a warm Louisville welcome to Mr. Tim Tebow. <clears throat> How many of you do CrossFit? So a lot of you do. I'm raising my hands to model for you what you should be doing. I'm not saying that I do it. I'm just... What, what do you think it is that has caused this to just kind of explode? Because it's the best. Okay. <laughs> I'm not going to argue with it. No. So would you please welcome Willie Robertson. every time. Gotcha. Okay, so the phrase is, in the motherhood. Do I say it like that? Exactly like that. In the motherhood. That's it. Okay. Oh, Jay. <laughs> he, he owns your car. He owns your health. He owns your passion, your creativity, your opportunity. He owns your marriage. He owns your kids. And I told one of mine, we're going to send them on ahead if they don't straighten up. And uh, I'm fascinated by this this hand walking thing. You know, it just kind of blows me away that a person can actually walk on their hands. Are you nervous? Not at all. My voice is shaking. Okay, here we go. Yeah. No. no. Oh. <laughs> I'm done. In Deuteronomy it says, I call heaven and earth as witness against you today that I have set before you life or death, blessing or cursing. So choose life that you and your descendants may live. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to think of the resurrection as the receipt. It, it's the completed transaction that Jesus paid for our sins on the cross, but the resurrection proves that the sacrifice was sufficient. He died just for you, and as sons and daughters of the Most High, how can we not let that name, that is above every name, be glorified? Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? Thanks be to our Almighty King, We, it was it was just an incredible two weeks, and uh, I hope you got to be a part of it. And it was great, except for that one stretch where I tried to walk on my hands. Uh, but we are so blessed, and we have so much to be thankful for. And if you are here at our campuses today, and you attended one of our Momentum events or one of our Easter services, let me just say thanks for coming back today. Uh, Southeast Christian Church is is a colossal collection of imperfect people who are trying to move in the direction of a very perfect God. 
And that's what we're all about, and that's what, what we want to be about in the years to come. Today, we start a brand new three-week series, and we're going to explore a variety of relationships, and we're going to walk through a book of the Old Testament, and it's the book of Ruth. And if you've never studied Ruth, it is a captivating book. And this week, I want to encourage each of you, whether you are watching on television or listening online or on the radio or, or you're here at church, I want to challenge you to read the book of Ruth. It will take you a whopping 10 minutes, all right? It's only four short chapters, but Ruth is, is, is full of all the slices of life. It's a story of loss, of heartbreak, of, of love, of day-to-day -day normalcy, of, of hope, and, and of patience. But there's something else going on. There's more to the story, and that is that God is doing something throughout the story of Ruth that shows us just how he is involved in our own lives as well. So take your Bible out. There's a Bible right in front of you. If you don't have yours, I want you to turn to Ruth. It's very easy to find. All you're going to do is go to the eighth book of the Bible. So we start in the Old Testament on the far left, and we go Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, then a couple of J's, Joshua and Judges, and then you find yourself at the book of Ruth. And for us to understand the setting in the book of Ruth, we actually have to begin with the very last verse that we find in the book of Judges. Judges is the seventh book. It was written at a very dark time, and it was still a very dark time when, when the story of Ruth takes place. Listen to the last verse in Judges, verse 20, chapter 21, verse 25. In those days, everyone did as they saw fit. One version says, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And we know that. We know people like that. We, when we leave God and his commands out, then that is a recipe for disaster. But in the midst of these dark and decadent days, there is a light. And we're going to find that there is a star of hope here in the, in the book of Ruth. Now, the book of Ruth begins with a very godly family moving to a very godless land in search of food. And the father of this family is Elimelech. And Elimelech has two sons. And they move to an area called Moab where they were not very well liked because Moab were natural enemies of the Jewish people. And we're going to see the different problems that this whole family encounters. And today I want to share with you three different lessons that I think we can make application to our, our very own lives. Lesson number one, God is in the middle of our difficult choices. Look in your Bible at Ruth 1, verses 1 and 2. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilian. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to Moab and lived there. Now, Moab was a very fertile and agricultural area, so it makes sense that that would be a place that Elimelech's family would travel during a time of famine. But it was not a, a decision that was motivated by spiritual needs. Instead, it was more by the physical needs. And they left their homeland going to this unfriendly and unfaithful country, facing the possibility of when they returned back to Bethlehem in Judah of being despised by the Jewish people. This was not an easy decision for them. It, it seemed like a lose-lose. We can starve to death here or we can try to get food in, in, a, in a pagan land and see if, if perhaps we can have something to eat. And after a short time, the Bible tells us that Elimelech dies. So the father dies. This is a very sad turn in the story. And many of you know what it feels like to lose a loved one. In fact, in, in the past two or three weeks, I cannot remember a time at Southeast when we have had more deaths than we've had in the last two or three weeks. And my heart goes out to those of you who, who have been touched by tragedy. And I, I want you to know that this week, if you read through the book of Ruth, you will see how God can, can make sense out of tragedy. It, it won't be quick, but it will take some time. And you will learn that there is a shepherd who loves you very much and who's walking beside you. And you do not need to fear the valley of the shadow of death, for he's with you to comfort you. Well, look in your Bible at the third verse of Ruth 1. It says, now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. 
So Naomi thinks that she's all alone and that she has been abandoned by God. But even when he, he seems absent in our lives, he's still there orchestrating decisions which can pull us closer into a relationship with him. So I want you to see the second observation or the second lesson, and that is God can work in spite of our bad choices. See, they made a bad choice to, to go there, and you'll see why in a minute. The father has passed away, leaving his wife and his two sons, and the Bible says that the two boys marry outside of the Jewish faith. Look at verse 4 in your Bible. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other one named Ruth. So Milan and Killian make a bad decision. They choose to marry foreign women, which was in direct violation to God's plan for the Israelites. Now, you, you got to make certain you catch this. The problem wasn't the, the ethnicity of the women. It was the theology of the women. They worship false gods. Moabites were worshipers of idols. One was a false god by the name of Kamash, who demanded human sacrifices. And no doubt that such a waffling of, of commitment when they intermarried across these faith lines would have resulted in some graven images and foreign gods being brought into their homes for a time. And while many of the choices that we will see in, in the book of Ruth are inconsequential, yeah, you can choose this or you can choose that, no big deal. This one's a big deal. And the writer makes certain that it is pointed out to us. They have crossed the line. They have diluted their belief system from the one true God to having many gods. And the Bible is very clear about this in the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy, in the seventh chapter, in the 23rd chapter. And then over in the New Testament, after Jesus walked the earth, we read of our marching instructions, and they're quite clear. In the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, in verse 39, it says, marry a man who is a follower of the Lord. So he instructs women to do that. Second verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, Paul says, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. It's a bad choice. That's an unwise decision. And yet, Milan and Killian both made that decision, and they married outside the faith. And we've all made mistakes. We've made plenty today, probably. Does, does God like Milan and Killian's choice to marry outside their faith? No, not at all. But after that has been made, can God somehow redeem it for his purposes? Absolutely. Absolutely. And it takes time, and it might involve some pain and some correction and some rerouting, and it's painful and it's long and it's difficult, but God can, God can work good out of what Satan intends for bad. It's like the young Christian couple who had been married for six months. They fought like cats and dogs. Finally, one night, the exasperated wife said to her frustrated young husband, she said, you know what, I, I've got a solution for us. Let's just both pray that one of us dies, and then I'll go live with mom. No, it doesn't work that way, all right? Look in your Bible at Ruth chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. After they had lived there about 10 years, both Milan and Killian also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. Wow. I didn't see that coming. Now, don't read into that, that this was God's punishment for them marrying outside the faith. The Bible never says that. It simply says that in the span of a decade, following the dad's death, the, the two sons also pass away. And if you think life was tough before, it just got much tougher for these three widowed women who are living in a man's world. You know, life throws us all sorts of detours. Some are devastating and others are inconveniences that we simply kind of have to navigate our way through. But I'm certain many a night Naomi questioned God and she said, why? Why has this happened? Is it because they, they broke your commands? Is it just because of the world that we live in now? Is it just because there's no food? What, why is this taking place? About 20 years ago, I spoke at a conference in St. Louis. I hadn't driven in St. Louis much, but when I got there, I found myself stuck in a traffic jam on my way to where I was speaking. And... I noticed while I was driving on the interstate and only going about 20 miles per hour that over in the far left-hand lane, they had these big signs that said express lane. And I thought, wow, I'd like to be in the express lane. These cars are just whizzing past. 
So I worked my way over to the left. I got in the express lane. It was heaven. I was going 65 miles per hour over in the express lane, having the time of my life. I had no idea where I was or where I was going, but I was making good time, you know? So I'm sailing along, passing all these cars, creeping along on the right-hand side. And after about 10 minutes, I saw my exit over on the right-hand side. I thought, great, I'll just go over and exit. Doesn't work that way. There's a cement barrier in between the express lane. And they only let you off of the express lane about every four or five miles. And so I had to drive past my exit, go four miles past it, and then get off, work my way over, go back through the little turtle land, go back up, turn left, take another left and stop lights, weave my way back onto the interstate. It was all said and done, it cost me about 20 minutes. This thing that I thought was gonna be this incredible shortcut. But I made it back and I got back on the right path. You know, throughout the Bible, we see a lot of people coming back on the right path. There's Jonah, there's a prodigal son, there's Paul, there's Peter. So there's a lot of stories of that. But can I just share with you that it's always gonna cost you something? It might cost you time, it might cost you a job, it might cost you your family. You can get on the right path, but it, it will cost you something. You've tried life in the fast lane and now you're heading back in the direction of God's will. How far out of the way did you go? Or have you even slowed down and paused to turn your blinker on? Or are you still hell bent in your own selfish direction, not paying attention to the directions that the divine has delivered to you? Regardless of the opportunities, that you may have bypassed in the past, it is not too late to get back on course. You see, in every choice we make, whether it's big or small, good or bad, God is behind the scenes weaving together a story that, that we can't completely see. And you can make certain of this. God doesn't control our choices, but our choices become the threads with which God weaves. So we see in this first chapter that God is in the middle of our difficult choices. God can work in spite of our bad choices. And the third lesson is this. God will lead us in our important choices. You see, all of your choices that you make, they all begin in your mind. It all comes back to there. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 2, Paul says, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. And so it begins with our thoughts, with those little choices and decisions that ripple out and they have huge implications and the Bible is clear that you will reap what you sow. Make, make no bones about it. You will reap what you sow. Sow a thought, reap a deed. Sow a deed, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, reap a destiny. What are you sowing? Look at verse 6 in your Bible. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then, so she's heading back home. Then Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. So Naomi is trying to be level-headed and give her daughters an, an out here, her daughter-in-law, daughters-in-law, and out. In her heart of hearts, she, she just doesn't think it's fair for them to have to take care of her. And so she says, you know what? I'll go back to my Jewish people in Bethlehem. You all go back to your homeland, and you can marry again then. Look at verse 9. She says, may the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. And then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud and said to her, we will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I'm too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. Naomi is trying to logically talk sense into them. Go back to your people. Go back to your life and to your world. 
because she knows it's going to be a rough existence. If, if they come back with Naomi back to Bethlehem, they'd be saying no to remarriage. They'd be saying no to a bright future. They'd be saying no to their own homeland. You know, God leads us in our important decisions. He always makes it clear. Throughout Ruth chapter 1, look at some of the phrases. The Lord has come to the aid. May the Lord show. May the Lord grant. You see, God is deeply involved in Naomi's lives and also in their daughters in law They just don't know it yet. Don't miss this. God wants to be involved in the decisions of your life too. He is a powerful God but he is a personal God who cares about the details of your life. So invite him into the process. Now look back at this exchange because this next passage is one I promise you, you have heard before. Ruth 1, look at verse 14. At this they wept aloud again. These are the daughters-in-law. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods, plural. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. Wow. Wow. What a moment. Sometimes you hear this passage read at at weddings. I think most people sitting in those sanctuaries may not be aware of the fact that it's talking about a friendship, it's not talking about a marriage relationship. But it is quite fitting to read at a wedding because at a wedding you are entering into a till death do us part relationship. And just when you hear those words, let it remind you of the level of loyalty and commitment that you need to bring into that relationship. Ruth is saying, I choose you, Naomi. I choose you. I choose Israel over Moab. I choose your people over my people. She's giving up and renouncing her heritage. She's saying, Jehovah, I choose you. I choose your God, not my God's. Do you ever wonder why? You think Ruth's deceased husband, or maybe Naomi, her mother-in-law, had told her stories of Adam and Eve, of Noah, of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, of Joseph, maybe about Moses crossing the Red Sea. It's probably a, a combination of hearing and learning and seeing how God sustained Naomi in the lowest moments of her life. But this verbal affirmation that your God will be my God is quite a statement given her heritage. At first glance, it appears that Ruth is committed to Yahweh because she is committed to Naomi. And sometimes we see that in our friendships and people that we introduce to faith. They're they're blown away that you've taken the time to invest in their life and, and, and taken an interest in them. And so just as with Ruth and Naomi, that original connection sometimes may actually be with a human relationship before they feel that connection with the Lord. But that is the ultimate goal. And yet God can use each of us as a reflection of Christ in our imperfection to lead them to Jesus. Roberta Cooney says it like this. She said, I have come to discover that sometimes people will come to love me before they come to love my Savior. And that's kind of what's taking place. Verse 18, when Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. Why did Ruth go against her heritage and her spiritual upbringing to go with Naomi? Now, I think it's because Ruth saw something real and genuine in her relationship with Naomi. She knew that there was authenticity there, and that authenticity is what what, what breeds a relationship to really grow and thrive. A couple of weeks ago, uh, someone set up a, a fake Facebook page claiming to be me and opened up a Facebook account. And uh, Kyle and I have experienced this on on numerous occasions. It just happens in in cycles, it seems like. And it's so sad and frustrating that someone is, is talking to our flock, claiming to be us, but they're not us. And people said all the last few weeks, oh, hey, told my family members, I've been corresponding back and forth with Dave on Facebook. 
Well, Dave's on Twitter, but he doesn't have Facebook, so you're not corresponding with him. Oh, no, he's been, he's been sharing with me. We've been writing back and forth. No, it's, it's, it's not him. And this individual, they put, he puts up quotes that I say in sermons and says all sorts of different things, and then they'll send a friend request out to people and privately correspond with them. And he or she, they, they act like they are, are me. But after corresponding for a while, he gradually asks for money. And he says, you know, I'm, hey, I'm in a financial bind and nobody really knows about it at church, but uh, I wonder if you could, could wire me some money. Now, I hope that people are not so naive to fall for that. And, and hopefully you know me well enough to know that I would never go on social media and privately communicate with you and ask you to wire money to me. Uh, I, I wouldn't do that. I, I would simply ask you for cash. Uh, you know, well, I would ask you to wire it to me. You know, cut out the middleman, you know. But it's a fake. And that's how Satan operates. He poses as something that he's not. And the Bible says that he masquerades as an angel of light when he's not what he says he is. And he selfishly wants something from you. Someone asked me, what, what bothers you the most about, about that fake account? And I said, you know, that's a very easy question. What bothers me the most is that someone is acting like they have a relationship when there really isn't a relationship there. I wonder if Jesus Christ ever feels that way about those who claim to be his followers. I wonder if Jesus thinks it's a fake relationship they say that they're my followers. They say I'm the Lord of their life, but it's like they really want me more as a Savior than as a Lord. They want all the forgiveness they can get, all the grace they can get, and all the salvation that's available to them. But when it comes to prayer or fasting or tithing or self-denial or loving the least of these, now that borders on being a fanatic. It's not that kind of a relationship. And in that case, it's not real. Let me say this as lovingly as I possibly can. Jesus in Matthew chapter 7 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name? Do we not drive out demons in your name? And I will look at them and say, Away from me, you evildoer. I never knew you. It was a fake account. It wasn't a real relationship. It was lip service on a Sunday. It wasn't a life service throughout the week. So you got to make a choice. And I hope you'll make the wise choice because choice, not chance, will determine your eternal destination. We don't know what happened to cause Ruth to say, I want your faith, but maybe it came about. Maybe it came about because she saw the way Naomi handled adversity. Now, there was no question that she was upset at the death of her husband. There was no, no question that she might have, might have shaken her fist at God when her two sons died. But somehow she worked through that with the help of God. You see, sometimes it's the realness and the rawness of our emotion that shows people, you know what? This is real, this is genuine, this is authentic. And hear me when I say that sometimes the most attractive feature of one's faith is the way that they handle suffering and adversity. And if you are walking through that valley now, maybe God is allowing you to so that some other people can see the way you respond and the way you lean on the Lord. This past week, one of our volunteers at church passed away. His name was Bill Dangerman. And Bill was a selfless servant. He he had Parkinson's disease for a number of years, and uh, he still served faithfully. I was talking with his wife, Rita, yesterday, and she told me about how when she and Bill started dating, they talked about getting married, and she talked a little bit about church to him. And he said, oh, if we get married, he said, you cannot ever ask me to go to church. Sunday morning is when I play golf. I, I, I won't go to church, so don't ask. And so she went into the marriage knowing that and agreeing to that. 
But after she had been married for four years, it was 1994, she came to Southeast Christian and she fell in love with the people and the message and the place. And she would come home every Sunday and she would tell her husband all about it and say, oh, it was incredible, it was great today. And she'd talk about the songs she had learned. Sometimes she'd be singing the songs around the house and yet she never asked him. But then he had shoulder surgery and she thought, this is my opportunity. And she said to him, hey, Bill, you can't play golf with your shoulder. Why don't you come to church with me? And he said, if I went in that place, the roof would cave in. And she said, Bill, everybody uses that. That's just an excuse. Try it. But he didn't. And sometime later, something possessed him to say, you know what? There's a joy that she has. And he saw all the excitement that she had. He enjoyed picking her brain on what she had learned that day. And finally, he said, I'm going to try it. And he went to church at Southeast. And after his first week that he came, he called up his golfing buddies. And this is what he said. He said, I will play golf with you any day of the week except for Sunday. Because he said, from now on, I'm going to church on Sundays. Do you know what he was basically saying? Although it was a statement to his friends, it was actually a statement to his wife. What he was actually saying was this. Your God will be my God. And so he started coming. And just like Ruth, in time, Bill personalized it. And it became his own faith. And he got into the word. He was baptized into Jesus Christ and committed his life to him. And because of it, now he's walking on streets that are golden. What Ruth saw in Naomi is what Bill saw in Rita. What will people see in your life? Let's pray. Lord, our choices that we make, they matter. And we're thankful that you are a God who can still work good out of our bad choices that we've made. And I've made plenty of them, and you know that. And so, Lord, we just ask that you would help us to move in the right direction in a God-honoring fashion that brings glory and honor to you. And we ask, Lord, that somehow we will get on the right route, on course, a path that leads us to Calvary as we die to ourselves and we live to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you've never turned your life over to Jesus Christ, this could be your day. This, this could be it. And God has brought you here for this moment in time. And you can say, this is the direction I want my life to go. There are others of you who are already believers in, in Jesus Christ, and we'd love to invite you to become a part uh, of this church family. Whatever your decision might be, you can meet me down front. Uh, you meet me down front as we stand together and as we worship.